I wanted to invite as our first distinguished speaker for this lecture series, a friend, someone that I've sparred with, someone that I've learned a lot from, someone who teaches me grace, uh, and at times he, he has taught me how to be even tougher uh, because he is a man of steel. Uh, Michael Steele made history as the first African American uh, to be elected statewide uh, in the wonderful state of Maryland. We hope to change that, Michael, uh, this coming season uh, with the election of Ben Jealous. But Michael Steele uh, has been involved in Republican politics for a long time. He often refers to himself as a Lincoln Republican. And tonight we'll try to get into what is the difference between a Lincoln Republican and a Trump Republican. And I'm sure in between uh, there are some Reagan Republicans who might want to beg to differ. Uh, Michael has uh, been uh, not only a national leader, uh, but he was elected chair of the Republican National Committee uh, in uh, 2009, following the historic election of Barack Obama. Under his leadership, uh, the Republican Party uh, not only uh, was able to raise a significant amount of money, over $200 million, build its apparatus, and in 2010, uh, the Republican National Committee uh, under his leadership, took back control of the Congress, one of the largest gains ever in the history of our country, much to my chagrin, Michael. Uh, but um, I felt it was necessary to bring in uh, a national leader, someone with stature, someone who understands the Republican Party, uh, to have a conversation about many of the major issues uh, that we're facing today, from gun violence uh, to uh, immigration reform, we're going to discuss the midterm elections, but we're also going to uh, focus on why it's important to revive civility in our public discourse. And Michael and I agree on a, on a lot. We're not just African Americans, former chairs of our, our respective political parties. Uh, Michael and I are also Catholic. He's probably more of a practicing Catholic than I am, but we're both Catholic. Uh, and we also uh, en enjoy uh, talking with young people about uh, their opportunities to serve in public office. Uh, Michael was also active in helping to start the young Republican, uh, college Republican chapter here at Howard University. Uh, and of course, in my background, I have uh, worked to improve and, and also help to register young African Americans and work with college Democrats across the country. So please give Michael Steele a warm wel a welcome here to the campus of Howard University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Thank good. you. Good to see you. You want me to start here? Yeah, or? yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'll, so, Michael, I'm, I'm going to use this analogy to start. And okay. It, this analogy is about the blue chef and the red chef. Okay. Okay. I'm going to be the, the chef with the blue hat, and you're going to be the chef with the red hat. That works. Now, the chef with the red hat has been in the kitchen for a long time. Um, they are not only in control of Congress, but most state houses across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been serving us a lot of red gravy with pork tenderloins, <laughs> uh, beef, beef. And, and let's just say a heavy, a, 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 yeah, heavy a dose of uh, mashed potatoes and shrimp. Uh, it's not my Cajun shrimp, but they're shrimp. That's right, right. Uh, the, the chef, of course, with the blue hat, we've been stirring the pots, but we don't have a lot of pots to stir. Uh, Democrats do not control Congress. Democrats are in the minority in state houses. And in fact, under the leadership of Barack Obama, Democrats lost more than 63 seats in the, in the U.S. House, 13 gubernatorial races, and 1,000 uh, state, uh, state offices. Yeah. So the, the I got about 760 of those. I know. Yeah. Uh, that's why I wanted you here, so we can right. find out how we can get it back. So the, the chef well, We're kind of giving it to you right now. Oh, but well, we're going to talk about that because we, we want a lot of them. Uh, and we want, we want African Americans to take those seats as well. Um, but the chef in the blue hat is, is now anxious to get back in the kitchen. Yeah. And we know that to get back in the kitchen, the chef with the red hat is going to have to share some of the pots and perhaps uh, allow us to create a different menu. Mm -hmm. My question, my question <laughs> to you is, how do we uh, improve the chances of both chefs being in the kitchen? If the Democrats right, take right. control of the Congress, if Democrats are in a position to help lead the way forward with President Trump still in the White House, possibly, 
or Vice President Pence, we don't really know right now. Um, what are the chances <laughs> that the chef in the red hat will allow the chefs in the blue hat to begin to put together a different menu? Okay, um, that's, that's, that's good. I like that, I like that analogy. Uh, first off, let me just say thank you for the opportunity to be here, to be back on Howard's campus. Uh, it's a real treat for me. The last time I was here, I was national chairman and we hosted a debate on healthcare uh, here on the campus, uh, which uh, turned into a very interesting and wild evening, uh, which was, was great. Uh, it was good for the party um, and I thought it was good for the students here. So it's a real pleasure to be back. I also uh, want to give a particular uh, you know, shout out of gratitude uh, to the Kings, Cobra and uh, Gwendolyn, thank you so much. The last time I was with uh, Mr. King, he was grilling me uh -oh. uh, in the boardroom of the Washington Post uh, as I was running for the United States Senate. Uh, folks, trust me, this is a much better space to be in right now. <laughs> uh, but so I want to thank you for that. And uh, if you give me one more indulgence, I want to give a particular word of congratulations to Jim Watkins, who built the studio uh, here at Howard University. Um, right. I was in this very in, in this very space back in about 1978 with Jim, uh, as he was laying out his vision uh, and putting into place the pieces of what is uh, a phenomenal uh, public studio, uh, student. Studio, studio and has uh, stood the test of time. So I just wanted to give a particular shout out to my friend who's now enjoying retirement for this, oh. right? So the red chef and the blue chef. Uh, okay, so here's the deal. The red chef controls the kitchen. Uh, and those of you who cook know how that is. When you control the kitchen, you control everything that happens in the kitchen. You control even who's in the kitchen. How many times have you been put out of that kitchen by your mama who said, uh-uh, baby, you need to take that out there, right? Mm -hmm. Don't touch so my that's, pots. That's right. That's right. So that's, that's the political reality of this moment. Only one chef in the kitchen at a time. And uh, this concept, unfortunately, unlike what we've seen in the past uh, with other chefs, whether that chef was Bill Clinton uh, and Newt Gingrich, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Um, you have not seen since the days of, of Bush uh, and, and Harry Reid and others this sense of, okay, you stir the pot, I'll get this, this menu started over here, maybe you can pick up and do a little bit of that. Here, I can have a little spice to that. You give me a little spice to put in here. That level of cooperation is unfortunately gone. Uh, and it has been dissipating for some time. So this, the space we're in right now is really nothing new. It has been, has been uh, creating itself for, for close to 30 years. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has impacted each party differently. So right now, the way Republicans look at the kitchen is um, we control all of this. Uh, what do we need to do to continue to control all of this? Mm -hmm. The reality for Democrats, for however you break it down, there's stuff that's beyond their control in that kitchen, but they'll be the beneficiaries of. Uh, there are going to be deliveries made this November, mm -hmm. all right, that they will be able to take advantage of, um, whether it's a, a particular kind of fruit, mm -hmm. uh, a different kind of vegetable, um, whatever whatever new ingredient is going to come into that kitchen, mm -hmm. they will have the advantage of being able to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will use it in such a way, obviously, to their benefit. Uh, now, the, the thinking is that both of those chefs are preparing a meal that everybody can digest, right? Well, we know that's not the case. Right. Uh, and that's often the challenge uh, that we see uh, in this particular uh, uh, political environment mm -hmm. is not just what are the ingredients, uh, what, what's the state of the kitchen, is it a clean kitchen, is it a messy kitchen, all of that, um, but what does this taste like when it's done? My concern for my party is that the folks who've been sampling the food along the way, again, sticking with that analogy, Thanksgiving, y'all come up to the table, you know you're going to take a little bit of something and see what it's like. And God help you if you ever look at your mom and go, ooh, yeah. right? Yeah. We're getting a lot of that reaction, mm -hmm. uh, as we've seen in special elections, in primary elections, and, uh, and others uh, since uh, probably early last year. Mm 
Mm -hmm. The reaction of those who are tasting what we are cooking um, is not necessarily consistently good across the board. Mm -hmm. Some people like presidential, uh, presidential nominees to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. others like tax cuts. Some folks are disheartened about, uh, you know, the lack of silence on civil rights. Uh, and in fact, when words have been spoken, they've not been very smart or good. Um, so you have this, this mixture mm -hmm. that in, in large measure, uh, that red chef doesn't know how to uh, fix the meal once it's messed up in his preparation. Uh, and so again, that's gonna benefit the blue chef mm -hmm. who is gonna sit there and go, well, that, you just messed that up. So we'll let people taste that and they'll, you know, they don't need to come to my pot, that'll be enough mm -hmm. to turn them off. Then you got the new ingredients with elections this November, which r will really reshape how the kitchen is ordered. One of the missing ingredient um, in American politics today is civility. Yes. The lack of civility, the lack of respect, the lack of trust in our institutions. How do we restore that? And is that important oh. uh, for the restaurant owner and the chefs to have some form of civility uh, as it relates to putting together that menu and serving it to the American people? Yeah, well, I, I think we, we, we have to take civility and, and contextualize it a little bit. Uh, so let's just say we're all for civility. You know, just as, a, just as a general premise to any discussion, we're all for civility. But we have to understand our nature and our history in this country. I don't know how many of you remember the election of 1800? <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Well, it was, it was pretty damn ugly. Um, uh, when you had Jefferson and Adams going at each other, you had, uh, you know, Alexander Hamilton and, and Aaron Burr uh, embroiled in a, a real ugly uh, match. Mm -hmm. um, that not just uh, impacted national uh, election for the presidency, but then tapped into state elections, the governor's race in New York, uh, which really set those two individuals, Aaron uh, Burr and Hamilton, against each other, which ultimately led to mm -hmm. the former vice president of the United States shooting and killing uh, the former secretary of the treasury. Um, so we've always approached our politics in this country, which is why our founding fathers were so concerned about the concept of political parties, because they didn't want something that would already enrage those passions to the point where people would be blinded uh, by those passions instead of seeing the broader, more important civic mm -hmm. responsibility they had to engage and debate uh, around then the Constitution and what it meant and other stuff. Uh, and what we're talking about today, again, about the Constitution and what it means, it means along with a, a lot of other issues. So the civility piece has always been um, a challenge for the American population, particularly the political class. So the question becomes, for me at least, Donna, what's the difference between 1800, uh, where that, that election you had people referring to Thomas Jefferson um, as a pimp, effectively, that if you elected Thomas Jefferson, your wife would become a prostitute. That was actually <laughs> part of the, 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 the language of the day, uh, talking about a political mm -hmm. opponent. Um, so the question is, what's the difference between then and now? Well, these boxes with red dots that cell phone you have in your hand. The ability to communicate um, instantly uh, translates uh, something that's not necessarily very emotional into an emotion. So how many of you tweeted something mm -hmm. uh, and you got a response back, well, what the hell are you talking about? How dare you? What do you mean? And you're like, no, it's just an innocent little tweet. There was, I mean, I wasn't trying to infer or mm -hmm. emote something. How people receive and perceive that information um, I think has really changed the way we engage politically. And of course, mm -hmm. behind that curve are politicians who were once in the forefront in dictating the terms of engagement, right? Because they would put out a pamphlet, they would put out a press release, and that was enough for the voting population because mm -hmm. there was no other means to get that information other than through those, those sources. And then, of course, when you get into the 50s and the 60s, you have the evening news. And that kind of framed some of it. But again, our news was not built around politics. Our news was built around the economy and world affairs. Uh, that's what Uncle Walter brought to the American people every night at 6 p.m. 
uh, was um, Walter Cronkite, for those of you. <laughs> I saw some people go, Walter, who's Uncle Walter? Um, and, and so you see this transformation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. through the information age. Mm -hmm. You know, we've gone from an agrarian society to a technological society to an information society. And it is this information society that has transformed not only uh, the, the culture, but the politics that gets stirred by that culture. And so this idea of civility now takes on a whole new uh, level of importance. Because provost, it's no longer that I don't like you because, you know, we disagree on some political issue. It's I don't like you because you don't agree with me. That's what our politics has become. I said, we can have the drawdown. We can do a, a Burr and a Hamilton, right, short of pistols at dawn, right? We can have that long raging discussion. That's what the mm -hmm. Federalist Papers was, essentially. Um, this long argument about what the Constitution meant and what this country stood for. Right. People wrote it out. Uh, today, um, they tweet it out, and uh, they do so in a way that further drags the country into a place where civility is hard to retain. Some people believe that the drama we witness on TV, uh, on cable channels, uh, on talk radio, is democracy in action. Is it really democracy or is it something else? Oh, hell no, it's not. No, it's not democracy. That's not democracy in action. What that is is tribalism run amok. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is basically uh, whether you're on the left side of the spectrum or the, or the right side of the spectrum, a, prog a progressive, a conservative, whatever, you use these vehicles as a form of animating passion. So I'm going to appeal to the things that I think will flip your trigger. Your, your fears, your concern, your, your background, your ethnicity. I'm going to make you afraid of her, and I'm going to make you afraid of him. And, and that's, that's what has been driving a lot of our politics, unfortunately, because we're now in a space where um, what matters is how many likes you get, how many retweets you get, how many uh, forms of affirmation you get. Mm -hmm towards that god-awful thing you just said or did, mm -hmm. which reinforces not just the god-awful behavior, but tells everybody else, and we all know this as parents, those of us who are parents, that uh, we are mindful of what our children see and hear because there are certain things we don't want them to emulate because we don't want that behavior to become natural to them, normal for them. Well, we're out of that space now. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of what you see being broadcast um, uh, on, on the networks and on the cable stations sort of plays to the lowest possible common denominator. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about how we get to elevating that because I, it's not a simple formulation, but I think it's an important one of how we do that. But I, I don't want to get ahead of that. No, I want you to get ahead of me because I want to ask you a question about the Republican Party today. Okay. Is this the same Republican Party you joined no. as a student back here in D.C.? No, yes. growing up here in the city. No, I grew up here in Petworth. Um, went to Archbishop Carroll High School, uh, just up the street a little bit, and uh, Georgetown Law School. So I, this has been home mm -hmm. for me in in all respects. And when I made the decision uh, in high school, 1976 was my first presidential election. Uh, I turned 18 that October before the November election. And I was drawn to uh, the Republican space largely by my mother, who's a Democrat. Uh, she's a, she is a, uh, a Roosevelt Democrat through and through. And she raised me in a way, she said, look, don't be a Democrat because I'm a Democrat. Uh, don't don't go out there and make decisions based on what someone else is doing or someone else is saying. Go learn from yourself. Educate your own mind and make your own decision. You're the one who's going to have to live with the consequences of it, so just go do it. And I did. Mm -hmm. I went out and I learned about both parties. And what I recognized and appreciated was the political home, the political home of African Americans was the Republican Party. Uh, the party has long since forgotten the role 
some key African-American leaders of the day, back in the day, uh, played in creating and forming the party, starting with someone like Frederick Douglass, who had unfettered access to the White House of Lincoln, mm -hmm. um, and uh, spent a, an enormous amount of time in conversation with Mr. Lincoln, so much so that some scholars argue he helped shape the Emancipation Proclamation out of those conversations. That's how impactful he was. Um, you had other individuals who played those roles. And for me, that was important. It, it made sense. Um, and it's like, well, if this is my political home, then all right, why not go home? Mm -hmm. um, reinforcing that for me was Ronald Reagan. What I admired about Reagan's run for the presidency in 76, which he lost, was not the run itself, but how he conducted himself in the loss how he stood before the nation uh, and rallied around uh, the Gerald Ford, who had beat him in the no for the nomination, but then called the country to service. In other words, called the country to go out and vote and be engaged and be responsible. And it really set up what he ultimately would do in 1980. Uh, and that inspired me. And that attached, I attached that, that mm -hmm. action, that moment uh, to republicanism. Uh, I didn't ignore the, the ugliness of the 68 campaign uh, that was put in place by Richard Nixon in which they made, the party made a calculated decision uh, to get disaffected white Southern racists, Democrats, to join the party who left the Democratic Party when mm -hmm. uh, President Johnson signed the uh, Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. Uh, again, what Nixon and others completely missed was the fact that it was Republicans who worked with Johnson to finish right. that, those pieces of legislation and wor work them through the Senate because Republicans controlled the majority uh, in one of those chambers, worked it through the Senate and got it passed. So we all had a hand in that. We all had a hand in making that happen. And the party made, uh, I think, a strategic calculation, a miscalculation uh, to play the race card. Mm -hmm. uh, in hopes of winning national elections. They were doing fine at state and local, but they were having a hard time overcoming the Kennedy mystique. Mm -hmm. And particularly since his death, they were sitting there going, oh my God, you've got Bobby Kennedy, you got Teddy Kennedy. We could be up to our eyeballs in Kennedy's well into the next century, all right? Mm -hmm. And that was a political calculation that they wanted to avoid. Uh, and I thought it was a miscalculation. So they played to that ugly, that ugly space. So when I look at the party today, I, today, I see a reversion to that space. And it, it is disheartening. How so? Well, because you have a president today who in, the moment, in a moment like Charlottesville, in my view, sides with the white nationalist racists. Okay. I agree. And instead of siding with the American people. Mm -hmm. For what? Mm -hmm. To satisfy two things. One his own ego, mm -hmm. they love me, they love me, they really love me, and two, to keep that base as close to his hip pocket as he possibly can. A political calculation. Mm -hmm. When our parties fall into the space where they make decisions based on, purely on political calculations, that's when the trouble begins. And that's, I think that's where the party finds itself right now, um, having to explain itself to a population of people who are sitting there scratching their heads saying, but wait a minute, there's, there's Charlottesville, there's the wall, there's this, there's this, that. Mm -hmm. And you saying to me, oh, we want your vote. We want you to join the party. So as a 17-year-old kid at the time I joined, mm -hmm. um, the space was very different. Mm -hmm. The conversation was very different. And it was, it was focused on, we could have our political differences, but ideologically there was something, there was a place you felt you could go because this idea of freedom and individual rights and liberties and responsibilities matter. Today it's about whether or not you agree with or disagree with the president. How did you get your call to serve as Lieutenant Governor, to run as Lieutenant Governor of Maryland? How did I get the call? Yeah. That's interesting because I, I started out uh, in prep, preparing to be a priest. Catholic priest, which has its own kind of interesting problems today. So uh, just can't seem to get away from crazy. Uh, but the, um, I, I, since I was a little kid, I wanted to be a priest. So I, I sort of had placed myself on that track. And in fact, after I graduated from Hopkins uh, in 81, I entered 
the Augustinian Monastery mm. uh, and um, left right before I took simple vows. And, and that was a whole separate journey. But what was important about it, because it led, I think, to everything else, um, was the sense of service. Mm. Public service to me has always been a real value. Uh, and it's an important value because our, the Gospels teach us uh, to serve the least of these. Mm -hmm. And it is not just necessarily clothing and feeding and visiting in prisons and, and, and those things. It's also how you provide in other ways, how you utilize the instruments of power, government, institutions, to work on behalf of the people you've been called to serve. Mm -hmm. So for me, once I left the seminary, um, the next part of the question and the journey was, okay, so where now, what does this mean? And um, I've actually stumbled into public office and public service sort of through a back doorway. I didn't have designs on being Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. Uh, in fact, I was part of the, this was Cheney before mm -hmm. there was Cheney. Uh, I was part of the search committee uh, to sort of look for um, Lieutenant Governor candidates for, for Bob Ehrlich at the time. And, Went, spent a whole day in these meetings doing this, and at the end of the day, I'll never forget it, 4.30 in the afternoon, I'm sitting there with uh, former U.S. Senator Bill Brock, who was heading up um, uh, the effort, and he looked at me and said, what about you? Yeah. I said, what about me for what? Mm -hmm. He said, what about you for Lieutenant Governor? <laughs> I started laughing, because <laughs> I was like, I'm party chairman. I've, I'd already built, built out a 10-year plan to sort of, you know, win in Maryland, you know? Here we go, we got to win in Maryland. So I said, well, I got to get back to you because I got to go ask uh, the wife whether or not I can go play on that playground. And the rest worked out. And, uh, uh, and so now, then and now, what I do is I bring those elements of my seminary days and training and, and the teachings that come from that, along with my own Catholic upbringing and experience. I brought that to my service as lieutenant governor, and I brought, I brought it to my service even in the most political space possible. Uh, as RNC chairman, which is why I never spoke a bad word about Barack Obama in that role. But in your book, as the, much like the party wanted me to. But, but you did write a book, uh, a twelve-step program yep. for defeating the Obama agenda. Yep. Um, how would you describe that book? That book was about defeating the policies, not the man. That policy was going after. That book was about going after uh, the philosophical differences between Democrats and Republicans. Mm -hmm. uh, why I thought we had an argument to make before the American people. Look, for me, my whole, my whole political space has been occupied around some very simple principles as a county chairman, state chairman, national chairman. That, and this is why I always got in trouble with the party because I've, I advocate for getting out and register to vote. I'm all for that. Do it. Got to do that. But at the end of the day, you still have to make a case to the people who are now registered. And you have to be able to stand behind the case you make. And so what we see happening where, you know, you start changing where people go vote, you start changing what time they vote, you start making it more and more difficult mm -hmm. to vote. My argument has always been, what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. If you have the better ideas, if you, if you offer the, the better value proposition, what is the problem? Why do you have a hard time? putting that in front of the people and letting them judge. So the book really laid out the arguments. And, and you know, it's very clear, whether it's from health care to the environment, uh, and, you know, I'm not a climate denier, by the way, and I, I wasn't in the book, um, but there are ways you can approach a, a controversy like that where there are clear philosophical differences um, that you can make the case based on money, you can make the b case based on policy, you can make the case based on any number of parameters. Um, but you just can't personalize the case. And, and so that for me was a very important uh, argument to make. Uh, so it, it set out for from the base of my party, because I was coming in as chairman. I come into a, taking over a party, enjoy this moment folks, we just got our clocks cleaned in 2006, all right? We, we lose the house, lost all of these seats. The money, the money, the interest in the party was like, oh, okay, we, we don't want to play anymore. Then we kind of convinced them to come back in 2008, and then who should the Democrats nominate but Barack Obama? Mm -hmm. So then you have that whole dynamic going on. John McCain, God rest him, did his, his valiant best, uh, but then tripped over 
tripped up over the economic issue when the economy tanked. People forget that he was actually leading Barack Obama going into the fall. Mm -hmm. And then Lehman Brothers crashed, and he couldn't respond to the economic crisis. That began to hit people in their pocketbooks. Right. So that was the backdrop. I come in, tr you know, two weeks, a week after Obama's uh, inaugurated, and I'm sitting there thinking, so now what's a brother going to do with all mm -hmm. of this? Oh, now you want me to be chairman, right? I got him down the street. I've right. got no leadership on the Hill. What, you know? But you make it work, and I figured the best way to do it was to remind the base, to remind the party, and to remind all Americans what we saw as the philosophical differences between the two of us. Last week, I um, held a informal uh, gathering of students and one of the uh, sophomores here, Paul, I believe, from Missouri, mm -hmm. wanted to know how to get more young people involved in politics, how to get more young people uh, engaged in, in voting and, and electoral participation. Ah, well, I think, you know, I think this environment is kind of fueling that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that there's some, some passions uh, largely on the, on the Democratic uh, progressive side. Uh, but there's some passions out there that are, are really animated, and that's important. But again, it has to be moored to something. Mm -hmm. It's got to be anchored. Um, you just can't go vote in anger, uh, largely because you really don't know what you're voting for at that point. <laughs> you can wind up. And I think, in part, that's what happened in 2016. People voted in apathy. You know, it's like, okay, the lesser of two evils. What do, what do, I, wanna, what do I do here? Um, I think for, I've always taken uh, a lot of, of interest in younger voters. Um, they are the seedbed for um, how the country is going to move and what the country is going to move towards. Mm -hmm. uh, and so their civic engagement to me has always been important. And what I say, what I say to uh, young audiences, um, young adult audiences, um, is don't ask for permission. Just you, you don't have to do that anymore. Don't 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 wait your turn. I mean, I look at while I you have some real big philosophical differences with Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Um, I admire the fact that she did what she did. I really do. I mean, as a political strategist, as a former party chairman, I, yeah, that's that's good. But the way she did it. Um, you know, she, she established her, her ground game and she went in and, went in and did it. Um, young gentleman out in Missouri, running, uh, Michigan, excuse me, uh, John James, running mm -hmm. for the U.S. Senate as a Republican, African-American, military guy, um, came in, swept in, created his space. What we saw um, Mayor Gillum do in Florida, created his space. What are you waiting for? You waiting for me to give you the okay? You waiting for Donna to give you okay? Look, babe, we're looking to retire. We're looking to sit back on that point with a little mint julep and some, some, some Creole and have some fun, right? That's, that's it. I mean, we mm -hmm. know. We know where the exit is. Now, not everybody does. <laughs> there are some folks who just like to hang on, right? Okay, but that's not an obstacle to you. You create your space. You own that space because you're being handed a country Right? That has some real problems. You've got debt coming out of your eyeballs. A baby born today owes the federal government $83,000. That's on your watch. Someone's got to pay it. A trillion dollars. Somebody's got to pay it. All right? That's, that's where we are messing up. And you got to get in the game sooner rather than later to correct it. Mm -hmm. That's, my, that's just my heartfelt view of it. Don't wait. Don't wait for permission. Create your space. Make your case. Make your case to your community. Represent that community and be elevated from it to go to public service, whether it's at the local level, the state level, city, national. There are no limits, right? At least that's what we were told. I see some of the students in the audience, and before I go to them, um, as Lieutenant Governor and also in your national capacity, how did you bring people together at different points of view to discuss 
issues of major concerns during your tenure as chair as well as lieutenant governor. That, Did you work with Democrats? Oh my gosh, yeah, I had to in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't work with the Democratic legislature, a whole lot would not have gotten done. So my responsibilities starting with the, with the elective office was education, uh, economic development, uh, criminal justice reform. So I'm the kind of guy who, I'm not a status quo person. Anyone who's worked with me or knows me know that I don't do status quo well. I, I would tell my staff when I would hire them, the quickest way to get fired uh, off my staff is to tell me, I don't know, we've always done it that way, et cetera, et cetera. Because that tells me you're not trying. That tells me you're, you're willing to accept you know, what's being given or what's being fed. Find a way, create the space, go around it, go over it, go through it, create the space. So for example, we wanted the, the governor um, Governor Ehrlich uh, and I, we ran on a platform of bringing charter schools to Maryland. Uh, the, let's just say the, the NEA nationally, uh, the state uh, educational uh, system, uh, along with Democrats in the legislature, were not happy about that idea. <laughs> and I had a meeting um, uh, with um, um, a number of legislators. I brought them up to my office, Democratic legislators, and here was the thing that I found so startling. These African-American legislators would come up to my office and they would sit in my office on the second floor of the state capitol and you know for some of them it was the first time they were there. And I was like, you've been in the legislature how long? So we can also have a conversation about how we use our power and authority. Because sometimes not too well. Certainly not efficient. But that was the moment to make the case. and I made the case. Here's why this is important, because I know the constituency in your community. <laughs> I know what those single moms and those families mm -hmm. and those parents and those grandparents are concerned about in your community. And this is what they told me when I was in your district two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I would share that information. Long story short, you massage the system, you work the system, you reach across the table. What, what about what I'm doing just really turns you off? What about what you're doing turns me off? Mm -hmm. Let's get that out of the way, because we can't work if we're both turned off. So let's work in the space where we at least see, okay, I'm not happy about everything, but I can move some pieces around to get to where we be, need to be. Long story short, we did. Uh, we got the legislation passed, and, and it, it uh, is now uh, part of the educational system in the state. We can have a philosophical, philosophical discussion about whether they're good or bad or whatever, but I saw the need by listening to the people. Mm -hmm. I brought that need to the legislators who had to make the ultimate decision, and I crafted the legislation in a way that would allow them to vote, to give them cover to vote for it, and to give the governor satisfaction to know that his lieutenant governor didn't drop the ball. I did my job. Uh, one other quick one on that was, further to that, I then did a year-long study of education in the state. I come up with 30 recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the head of the, the teachers union in the state condemned what I did before she had gotten the report. So it was clearly politics, right? All right, fine. I invite her to the office. I sit down. I give her, give her the package. I said, this is what I'm looking to do. Mm -hmm. We spent, folks, I'm telling you, the first 30 minutes crapping on each other's shoes. We stood in our political corners. She would come at me about Republicans hating public, public education. I would come at her saying, you know, you're dumbing down the system, you're not challenging, you know, the whole thing. And then something struck me, and this is where my seminary training came in. Something struck me and said, you need to stop this now. And I looked at her and I said, we can continue sitting here crapping on each other's positions or we can work together to do something for the students in the state. So let's start this conversation again. We did. And we found a way in which we could put package, a, out of what I recommended, package a bill that would increase teachers' pay, give uh, local school boards a little bit more authority, et cetera, et cetera. So we found Oh my God, I'm going to say it. Don't know everybody. Pass out. What? Compromise. All right. Don't, uh, that's a dirty word. That's a dirty word. And it will yeah. pass out out there. Um, but we found a way to compromise. And so that, that for me is, is 
how you drive the system. You're going you're gonna to find the point where you're like this, but someone of you, has to, it has to stop in your head and go, wait a minute. And you did that. I've okay. seen you do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's so important that you, you get to that point where you say, this is not going to go any further because where we're both standing is cement. Let's talk about a couple of pressing issues today. Sure. Ju Judge Kavanaugh. Will he be confirmed? Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's got a uh, look. You think he has the votes? He's, I'll think. Yeah, he's got the votes. Will he lose Susan Collins and no. Lisa Murkowski? No, I don't think so. Jeff Flake or uh, no. Ben Sass? No, and he'll probably get two Democrats. Okay. Uh, I know someone in the audience will probably follow up on that. Immigration reform, will Trump get his border wall? No. Okay. Um, will uh, gun violence, will the new Congress approve any legislation to stem the tide of gun violence in no. this country? Health care, pre-existing conditions, that's back, back in the conversation. Will the administration overturn the individual mandate and uh, pre eliminate pre-existing conditions? Well, they've already overturned the, uh, the mandate. Individual mandates, They've already overturned the mandate, so that, that puts pre-existing conditions back in play. Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, and what's going to happen, again, we didn't talk about... And I don't want to give the Democrats a playbook for November, but it's, it's so damn obvious at this point. You know what's going to happen in about three weeks. Everybody's going to get a notice from their insurance company. And that notice is going to tell you just how much your premiums are going to go up starting January 1st. Sticker shock won't even begin to explain. In, our st in my state of mm -hmm. Maryland, we're already looking at a minimum increase of 30%. They're projecting, some analysts and in the industry have projected at one point they would, to really be in that sweet spot so they wouldn't have mm -hmm. any issues, a 90% increase in premiums. I, I don't know how the American people, so that tax cut everybody got, bye-bye. Because now whatever savings you're getting out of your paycheck every two weeks, will be eaten up by an insurance company when you start having to pay that premium come January. So that health care issue is a sleeper issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the tax cuts have not resonated. You, do you hear Republicans talking about tax cuts? Nope. No. No. It's no. like you would think, I mean, the economy, 200,000 jobs last month. You've got, you've got the Dow kind of making the resurgence mm -hmm. after sort of leveling off and sort of cleaning up some of the, the cobwebs. It's going back up. Uh, the NASDAQ is pushing up, upward. Um, tax cuts are in firm, firmly ensconced in, in the, the body fabric of the economy, and no one's talking about it. Why? Because the way it's translated for a lot of blue-collar, middle-income workers is to about 20 bucks every two weeks. Now, I can get excited about 20 bucks on my own, maybe. But a family of four? No, that, that won't fill up your tank. It won't fill up your tank. So, up your tank. so you've got these other dynamics yeah. out here that are coming into play, and the healthcare one is a sleeper issue mm -hmm. uh, that will, will begin to bite. Uh, and again, the president just, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, was basically doubling down, saying, oh, we want to revisit the Affordable Care Act in 2019 because there's four, more stuff we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, good luck with that. Good luck. Let's open it up to questions. And we have a microphone right there in the middle. It's a little hot in here, but we'll, we'll cool off. Yeah, yeah, we'll cool off. We'll cool off. There's lights. Anyone with a question? Yes, sir. Please state your name and where you're from. Uh, hi, my name is Cameron Nelson. I'm a hey, freshman Cameron. history major from Chicago, Illinois. Uh -huh. I'm a Howard, I mean, I'm a student here at Howard. Excellent. So my question is, talking about all of these policies and what's going on throughout the United States, uh, this for both of you, out of the two levels of government, um, local and federal, mm -hmm. which do you think would be the most impactful for us in ev everyday society? Your local government. Always. Government, government closest to the people is the government that works best. Uh, a lot of your um, federal uh, representatives, state, senator, congressman, uh, they are slightly removed 
from that process. Their interest becomes redirected by special interest groups here in town uh, and elsewhere around the country. So their agenda becomes something that's a little bit more detached from. In our, in our space as national party leaders, um, yeah, that's who we play with. We're, you know, we're about electing Always. the congressman and the senator and the da-da-da. But where, where folks live out their lives every day, where they pay their bills and their taxes, where they raise their kids and educate them, where they start their businesses, that's a mayor, that's a city council, that's a state legislator. That's where uh, government has the greatest impact uh, every single day. Uh, I tell folks when they, when they want to get into politics, uh, there's no sweeter space to begin than reshaping and impacting your own community because you can see the ripples a lot better, a lot more clear. And guess what? There's this little thing called accountability. Because uh, when you, as a city councilman, walk out of the house and put your trash outside, you just did something that your neighbors don't like, they're going to let you know. They'll let you know. And even while you're on campus here at Howard University, you are part of the ANC, the Advisory Neighborhood Commission. Yes, yes. And often students run for those positions. It's a local position. You're elected uh, to serve, but you're elected to serve and, and have significant input into things that happen in this community and, of course, the, the general community, Howard University campus and Petworth and some of the other surrounding neighborhoods. So it's a great opportunity to get involved in local politics. When I was a student at LSU, I was appointed to serve on the uh, Fair Housing Commission. Oh, okay. And the reason why I wanted to be on the Fair Housing Commission uh, was because students often have a hard time finding affordable rent. That's right, that's right. And that's I right. made a case that we needed more, we needed rent control. Right. I'm, I'm a classic liberal. Right. Right. Uh, so I wanted rent control apartments uh, surrounding uh, the LSU community in Baton Rouge. So to make it more affordable. Yeah, you have to get engaged and get involved in local politics, but while you're on campus, you should also uh, get involved in the politics in this area as well. And work so on a you. campaign. Um, oh, yeah. You can work on, you can work, even though you may not be from the District of Columbia. Uh, look, as, as, as a young Republican, uh, I, I really spent very little time with any, I didn't really spend any time with Republicans at all until I got to Maryland mm. uh, and realized that there was, oh, there's all this infrastructure. <laughs> um, mm. It was like, oh, what do you do with all this? So I learned, I learned by working on campaigns. I was an intern on Capitol Hill for Walter Fontroy, uh, Congressman Fontroy. Uh, I had very good friends with uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Yes. Uh, she and I have had our row together from time to time, but I learned and listened to someone like that, uh, even as a Republican, uh, because it wasn't about the party labels, right. it was about the service. Watching these people in service, doing what, doing what they're supposed to do, was very, very important. One of, little known, one of, one of my key mentors, um, and he advised me uh, very quietly on my run for the United States Senate, was uh, God rest him, Marion Barry, mm. former Mayor Marion Barry. Uh, I'd known Marion a long time. And I'll never forget when I got that phone call, 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> of course. He was like, uh, Michael, we need to talk. I was like, okay. So, so you, you learn from the people <laughs> around you um, and engage with them and get involved um, at the grassroots level. Even though you may not be from this community, it's not your home, you're from Illinois, um, get involved in some of the campaigns and, and sort of get the feel and the rhythm of what's going on because Politics, like Tip O'Neill said, all politics is local. It's the same everywhere. It all boils down to what's happening in the backyard. Next, thank you so much. Thank Before you. The, Thanks, man. Keeping in touch. Next question. Good evening. Thank you both for being here. My name is Natasha Alford. I'm deputy yeah. editor of thegrio.com, ah, a site yes. dedicated to, to covering black communities' issues and particularly politics. So the question I have for you is, what advice would you give to the record number of black candidates that we're seeing running at all levels of government from Andrew Gillum to Stacey Abrams? Right. You know what it takes to actually win campaigns. Even though the dynamics are different in every state, what would you tell them about how to bring it home? That's an excellent question, and, they, and they, it's an, an incredible uh, group of men and women on both sides that are running uh, for everything from governor to senate to, to local races. You know, I, I think the, the, key, the key element of a campaign, it matters who, who you surround yourself with. 
Oftentimes what happens in these campaigns is consultants come in and they reshape the personality of the candidate. Mm. And, and I've already begun to see it happen in a couple of races, and it's unfortunate. My bet is they lose. Because the one thing people have a nose for is authenticity. They can smell the crap a mile away. And they'll sit politely, particularly in the black king. You know, we will sit very politely, <laughs> and we'll listen. <laughs> and well, yeah, I ain't voting for you, right? So that's, that's you've got to be sensitive to that. You've got to know when you have just crossed that point where people see you as something other than yourself. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, and I think when I look at, I watch uh, Andrew Gillum, on a number of shows, he was on Meet the Press. I was on that show that particular day, uh, Meet the Press Daily, and he was doing the remote. And I just watched, I got to watch him in space, but on TV, you know, kind of deal. And I was like, okay, he, get, yeah. That's, it comes through. It comes through the box, that authenticity. Now, his challenge is going to be different mm -hmm. because Florida, he's asking Floridians to buy a lot. <laughs> Because you all know, Florida doesn't have an income tax, right? And he's right. talking about a whole lot of free stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see what they buy. But that initial piece where you begin to establish trust with the voters, I think is important. It's a very important piece. But then strategically as a campaign, um, go where you least expect it to go. So if, you're, if you are a Democrat uh, running as a progressive even, um, in a state that you know you're going to win, you're going to win your vote, still go to a community that's not one that's necessarily going to support you. We've seen playbooks over the last 30 years from Ed Brooks in Massachusetts, Massachusetts to yeah. Doug Wilder and Virginia to uh, Deval Patrick in Massachusetts, yep. Barack Obama in Illinois, Carol Mose LeBron. So there's, there's and Michael Steele, yeah. there, there's a Ken Blackwell, I Ken can Blackwell, go on and yeah. on. I mean, look yeah. at me, I'm, now I'm thinking. Uh, there's a playbook for African Americans running statewide. And if you look at the history, that, state, that, that playbook is you have to be a viable candidate. One. They have proven that. Yeah. Uh, they have been able to build coalitions. Two. And yep. now it's time for them to broaden their message and their appeal. That's right. Because independents are the key to win in, in the fall. I think what Stacey Abrams is doing in Georgia is very important. She's enlarging the electorate, but she is still trying to appeal the independents. If they can, I, I believe all of the candidates, we have a, 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 a record number of African Americans also running for Congress. 100% of the Democrats who are the newly elected uh, nominees you have women winning their primaries. So, so yeah. Ms. Presley, yeah. uh, you, you have an African-American woman in Connecticut. Uh, I got a call today from an African-American woman running in the state of Iowa for Secretary of State. I'm yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yes, I know who she is. Uh, I mean, it, it is, it is, yeah. it, it's huge, just yeah. the, the, the sheer volume. And I'm telling all of them, go beyond their base. The base is important. Don't ignore the base. But you got to build, you got to build a bridge. And that bridge is going to take them over and allow them to win. But they're viable, they're strong, right. they, they have to have a message that's compelling. And I totally agree, don't, the cookie cutter campaigns, they, they don't work they anymore. They don't work anymore. The American don't people work. don't want that. They don't want something stale. They want something fresh. And they want fresh ideas. And they also want the leadership of these young people who right. are coming up through the ranks. Uh, who I do believe will make a huge difference this fall. I don't think they went crazy anymore either. Mm. No, they're we, done we with crazy. We did that in 16. We're like, okay, that didn't, okay, yeah, we're they, done with that. They, they're done with yeah, that, I think so. That. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Nam Nguyen. I'm a cancer physician at Howard and also a research organization uh, for elderly cancer patients and mm -hmm. minority. I have two questions about healthcare system. Okay. The first is a little bit controversial. Do you think one day American would agree to pay high taxes? For well, okay. uh, well, agree to pay high taxes for health care? Yes. Okay. Universal health care, Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. And that's the first question. Okay. The second question, if you have cancer and you don't have health insurance, do that, basically. Right. The second question is about research. Current research in the U.S. for cancer, at least, is focused on 
Edo Caucasian, mm-hmm. okay, exclude minority, mm-hmm. exclude elderly patient. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. For example, and then for elderly for cancer patient, for example, 40% of the cancer occurred in elderly people. Okay. It increased with age. Yet, the age for screening for lung cancer or for, ma- for more breast cancer stopped at 75. Mm. Okay. So how do we change Congress to change the law so those people, now we have people who live longer, they are productive for society. How can we change the law such as they could have, um, I would say, an affordable and fair healthcare system? That's a long question. I have to tell you a story. Um, 20 years ago, I, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And I refuse to accept it. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm like, no. I have, on my dad's side of the family, we have the breast cancer gene. And so I went ahead and participated in this series of research. And I learned that most of the research for women's health, and especially cancer, was in the defense budget. Not in, not in, <laughs> it's exactly where it belongs. <laughs> it's in the defense budget. <laughs> and I was given $20 to participate in all of these, $20 per visit, to participate in the survey, and I went back to Capitol Hill, and I said, we have to change this. Women's health need to be a priority in this country, and it needs to be included in its own budget, right. a standalone. And of course, since then, we've had you know, legislation passed, uh, but we, it, it starts with understanding how all of these bills, all of the health care laws, when, when the Affordable Care Act was written, it was 3,000 pages. It was complicated. And it was complicated because health care is complicated. And I'll never forget being on television for two weeks explaining to the American people. And during the Trump <laughs> run, I was on TV explaining how the appropriation for certain sections that were being repealed in the Fourth Circuit. And I was saying, well, Section 1501 applies to the appropriation. Yeah. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, why am I doing this to the American people? Right, right. It is extremely complicated. And before you unravel what we did in 2010 with the Affordable Care Act, you have to go back to practically almost to the 1930s and 40s to see how health care was delivered to the American people through the laws. And so it's complicated. Uh, The research is complicated. The, The funding is complicated. And I think what's going to happen now is going to make it even, it's going to make it worse. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you raise a very important uh, concern. I, I serve on the Cancer Treatment Center, Centers of America's board and uh, very sensitive about um, federal, state, uh, private support for cancer research. Um, there are particular types of cancers that get more research than other types of cancer. So there, there are all these variants that, uh, that come into play. Putting, putting those dollars for women's health under the defense budget, why is it there? Well, because NIH is under the defense budget. Uh, and so those dollars go to that space. Um, we don't do carve-outs very well. We don't prioritize very well, which is why we need a new set of leaders who understand that and are willing to go out and prioritize the nation's business in a way that addresses uh, appropriately the level of concern and and care and attention we need to pay uh, to these things so that the dollars actually get where they need to to go um, and you can actually enhance the opportunity uh, to get the research done in a way that doesn't limit uh, the ability for people to find cures, et cetera. The other, that then, of course, ties into your first question about the state of the, the nation's healthcare system. <laughs> uh, so there are two things uh, I want to drop on that. The first is, what was a defining moment for me in the healthcare debate uh, out of 2010? Um, was the day Barack Obama stood before the nation and referred to it as Obamacare. That day, I felt he lost, he lost that fight. Mm because he he did the one thing you don't do in politics, and that is to use the language of your opponents to define your issue, and he did. Mm. Um, Because, and here's why that's important. National polling show that 70% of the American people were against Obamacare, 
National polling showed that 65% of the people supported the Affordable Care Act. Oh, okay. okay. You never use your opponent's language to define your cause. And the day he did that, I'll never forget watching him do that, stand up there and refer to it as Obamacare. I went, game, set, match. That's point one. Point two, Republicans, on the other hand, never <laughs> learned anything from that moment. <laughs> because in their obsession to take down Obamacare, which had more to do with Obama than the care attached to it, because we all know what Obamacare really is, right? Mm. It is the 1994, I believe, or 92 version of the Heritage Healthcare Plan. Right. Okay, are we up on that? So we know mm -hmm. what we're talking about. We're not, we're not confusing ourselves in referring to something that, you know, Republicans aren't familiar with. Um, so there's that, that sort of subplot there. Um, and I've always argued to be honest about where you're coming from, which is one mm -hmm. of the issues that I think Mitt Romney had when trying to avoid defending Romney care, which was Obamacare, which was the heritage plan. Um, <laughs> so you see how definitionally uh, our leaders get themselves tripped up. And the problem is it, does, it then does impact policy. And you saw seven years of Republicans saying repeal and replace. And then when given the moment to both repeal and replace, they could do neither because there was no plan, because the root of the system had already grown deep. Obamacare had been in place for five years. And I remember at that time, even as national chairs saying, now in the country, now the political leadership has to figure out, as we did with Social Security, as we did with Medicare and Medicaid, figure out how to manage it accordingly. Because it's like inject, uh, injecting a dye into your vein and then the doctor goes, oh, geez, that's the wrong dye. I meant to, I got to take that out. Really? How are you going to take a dye out of my bloodstream? It's in the bloodstream. So the bottom line is, yeah, the day will come where the country has to reconcile itself to a healthcare system that is very different than the one we have right now. The question is, is it a hybrid where there are parts public, parts private, where some can go into a sort of a Medicare for all system? and others who wish to stay outside and, and pay full freight can, um, or whether it becomes a mm -hmm. full-throated uh, Medicare for All program. I think that's the, that's the next point of the spear in the debate. And thank you for your great question and your that's great work. That's a good work. question. Uh, we got time for a couple more questions? Yes, sir. Good evening, my name is Don Crawford. I'm a 2L in the law school. Uh, here at Howard. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, I think right now uh, the parties both have a chance to redefine themselves. Uh, on the Democrat side, you have kind of this establishment Democrat sentiment versus the Cortezes of the party. Uh, and then on the Republican side, you have the alt-right versus what would be your Ronald Reagan establishment right. Republicans. Uh, what would both of you say to uh, young voters or people who are looking to get into the uh, electoral process, what would you say to them to uh, get them to join and get them to support each of the parties? Well, I would first of all say the, the door is wide open on the Democratic side, and you see that in all of the primaries. Uh, and it's not just the primaries on the East Coast or the West Coast, it's, it's happening all, all across the country. Uh, four years ago, Democrats were not even running for uh, various seats in, in certain red states. Mm -hmm. Even in the Virginia uh, situation four years ago, we didn't have Democrats to fill one third of the seats. Last year, Democrats ran for every single uh, delegate seat, and you saw what happened. So my recommendation is the door is wide open. There's this myth that somehow or another we have gatekeepers. There are no gatekeepers. And I think one of the reasons why people are still in the room holding down their chair is because we don't see a lot of people willing to come in. So if you're ready to come in, come in. The door is wide open. The question is, are you ready to serve? Are you ready to lead? And we need more people to take on leadership roles not only within the party as elected leaders, but also those who are willing to help usher in a new era and recruit people to run. So it's, it's, your, it's your turn. Uh, it is your turn, um, but here's your problem. While both parties want you to come in, and Donna's absolutely right, the door's wide open, come on in. But the minute you cross that threshold, this is how we play in this, in this <laughs> space, all right? Parties are, parties for a reason. They've been in existence for as long as they have for a reason. 
uh, you cannot uh, readily go out and launch a party and get on a ballot and run because the system is designed to not allow that to happen. Let me repeat, it's designed not to allow that to happen. They like this system the way it is. It feathers their particular caps the way they want those caps to be feathered. Uh, those moneyed interests get what their piece is. That was one of my big problems as the RNC chairman. I came in and said, now nah, we're not paying money on these contracts anymore. And people were like, uh, excuse me, we've had this contract for 10 years. I fired them and they, got af they came right after me. And I'm, and I'm like, well, they, I fired them. that was 10 years ago. Guess what? You won't have them for the next 10 or at least as long as I'm chairman. And they made sure I wasn't chairman long. And right. they're all back at the DNC with those big fat contracts. And they're all back at the RNC with those big fat contracts. <laughs> so that's, that's the system. That's the system. So here, here's a proposition. Shake it up. You have to. I've always argued that the strength of our democracy is the fact that we recognize that piece, that we are free to go out and do and act and behave in the way that we find empowering and fulfilling and all of that. So gather the storm. Gather young people around this idea that we want to create a space, as I was saying a little bit earlier, take ownership. Own the space. Make the most of it. Just because these two structures are here doesn't mean you have to play within the lines of those two structures. Use them the way they use you. We've already seen examples of that, um, where you have independent campaigns uh, come out of nowhere in, in um, um, elections for governor, in elections for, I mean, Bernie Sanders, for heaven's sakes. He's not even a Democrat. He's not even a Democrat. He's an independent, sort of, kind of. It's independent. <laughs> independent. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't know what kind of independent, but he's an independent. So it, it, the space is there. The space is there. And, and so... Uh, I've always long been an advocate for opening up the system because I love the idea of the competition. Ideas, policy, process, people getting their fingers dirty in the mix of uh, trying to grind out the future of this republic. Uh, that's powerful stuff. So yeah, you can play within the lines, but do, I mean, I'm not saying do like I did, get in the room and then go, okay, now I'm overturning the furniture and throwing some stuff out the window and, you know, blowing up the commode. Um, that not, may not be your style, but there are ways in which you can operate effectively within the guidelines and then boom, boom, uh, and push out space. And as you push out space, and I'll use a Thurgood Marshall uh, uh, quote to, to give it context. He talked about um, we all got where we are, you know, by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. But from time to time, someone had to bend down and help us. Well, that's where you are. When you walk mm -hmm. into that space, you're in the process of, of being in the room and then bending down and helping others and pushing them ahead, which we're not very good at, by the way. Um, but we need to be if, if you want to change what is currently uh, the bipolar political parties that we have. Did you serve on any committees within the RNC before becoming chair? Yes, funny you should ask that, yeah, which well, is again why I found my tenure to be so amusing. Um, I, w I was state party chairman. Uh, I was appointed uh, the first African American to serve on the executive committee mm -hmm. of the RNC by Governor Gilmore mm -hmm. of Virginia, who was then chairman of the party, uh, appointed me uh, to serve. So I served on the executive committee for two years. So I already knew the inside, mm -hmm. you know, uh, commotion uh, and uh, had a very good appreciation for it, having served as a state chairman, county chairman, but then be at that table in that space. Um, look, you can, you can approach politics in a, any number of ways. You can go and run and become the governor, lieutenant governor, U.S. senator of your state, whatever. Or you can say, look, we want to, as we've just witnessed, and Donna and I were just talking about <laughs> her ouster as a, as a superdelegate uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but, that, but you know what that's from. To your point, you open the doors, you let people in. There are consequences because they bring that, that into that space, and that churning is good. It's, it's healthy and for the institution. And one-fourth of those superdelegates are African Americans. And yeah. if Stacey Abrams and Ben Jellis and Andrew Gillum are elected governor, they will not be able to vote on the first ballot. And Professor Ron Walters, who was um, 
in the political science yeah. department here. His wife, Mrs. Walters, is here. He was instrumental in and, changing and that, those yeah, party rules that gave us a seat at the table, only to see uh, now that we have accrued enough power to basically nominate a black man and a white woman, now we have been effectively disenfranchised. Which I, I find that fascinating. I do too, and I'm angry about it. I'm, but you know, I'm not over. I'm not finished. I know you're not done. Not, I know you're not done. I'm going to get it back. Up. <laughs> yeah, just warming up. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a couple more. Miss Alley? Two more. All right, make it quick so we can get through them. Right. Okay. <laughs> My name is Ayanna Mitchell. I'm a graduating senior here at Howard University. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my question is, uh, do you have any advice for young people who are interested in getting into politics? Uh, going back to your earlier point, young people are tired of crazy. So yeah. how would you, uh, do you have any advice for young people who are interested in stemming the tide of extremism in both of the parties? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, and, and I'll be honest, it's a very difficult question to answer for a lot of reasons, some of which we touched on just now, the party mm -hmm. process and the gatekeepers and all of that. But uh, I go back to what I said a little bit earlier about permission. Um, a, key, a key element of that is you deciding or your group of friends deciding, we want to change this. We, we can't accept status quo. And let me give you the best and most perfect example of that, the Parkland students mm. in Florida, who in the face of incredible odds, not only changed the nature of discussion of guns in this country, but actually changed legislation mm -hmm. through legislative action, um, laws in, that impact that issue in the state of Florida. They also played a phenomenally important role, and Donna knows this firsthand, in the election of Mr. Gillum yep. to his seat, I mean to this nomination, mm -hmm. which tells you the power that comes from organization, yes, yes, but collective action, where you committed, this is, the, we're not going to, it's, it's like, uh, what's the movie, uh, we're, we're tired and we're not going to take it anymore. I mean, you kind of get, yeah. what well, was that network? Yeah. You get to that point where you're just like, this is it. So find that spot for yourself because you know it's there. You know it's there. Everybody knows where that spot is. Go into that space. Find others who are in that space with you and figure out how you disrupt. Not destroy, but disrupt the process. What I see the president is doing is, at, at one point, I could see the disruption, because I'm a disruptive political player. I don't do kindly with status quo. So I want to disrupt the process. But there is a fine line between that and destroying and destruction, because that then takes out all the things that people value, that matter. Um, and when the president's team talked about deconstructing the administrative state, they told us what their mission was going to be. And now they're acting on it. So I say to you, define what your mission is going to be and then act on it because you'll be surprised how many more people will stand with you in that action and on that mission than against you. Uh, and again, I go back to those, those students in, in Parkland who were told, you can't do this. You, the legislature's not, you can't even get a, they couldn't even get a meeting with legislators to talk about the bill. And yet they defeated them. So you see where the power ultimately rest right. in the idea. True. And I, I think that that's, I would, I would encourage that, that as a spirit uh, more than anything else because you need that because it's not going to be easy because the system doesn't want to change. You know, what Donna's talking about, um, it, her time at, at the DNC, my time at the RNC, we've seen firsthand, the uh -huh. system does not want to change. Just read her book and know what she had to put up with just to try to keep the peace, and then the stuff she got blamed for that she didn't even know about <laughs> because the system doesn't want to change. And so we'll look for scape. It will scapegoat you. It will scapegoat your dream. It will scapegoat your ideas. It will scapegoat your actions. That's why you need to have that spirit to go into it because when that happens, you need to rely on that spirit to push through it like those students did. Before I got involved in electoral politics, I was involved in my community. In fact, I got involved at the age of nine to build a playground. 
And just this past week, my hometown, my, the city where I grew up in Kent, I was born in New Orleans, uh, the mayor decided to ban all Nike shoes and products from the booster club. <laughs> now, it just so happens that the booster clubs that rely on donations and gifts are in the quote-unquote <laughs> south part of, of the course, city, of which course. is the poorest part, which is also where most of the African Americans resided. And so my niece, and you know, my niece is not political, but she thought this was important. She sent me a text on Sunday morning with the memo from the mayor's office, and of course, I took the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and by Sunday night, the mayor of New Orleans, and then the Time Picayune, which is why I love Colby King, because the editorial board and the editorial writers, uh, we got a Colby King in New Orleans, uh, took on the, the mayor of Kenna, and now people are galvanized. Right. They march on City Hall. You gotta start where you are. You don't start here, you start where you are. You start in your community. And I made a promise to donate $2,500 toward the purchasing of Nike shoes for those young kids, because they're my kids. I may not have given birth, but those kids from South Kenna, that's where I grew yeah. up. And that's my playground. That's my start in politics. And when I made that decision, I mean, I got it just about every football player on the Saints said, well, I'll get my shoes. I got, like, okay, everybody, we'll have shoes for the next 20, you know, 20 years well, right. in Kenna, Louisiana, thank the go. Lord. But you got to start where you are. Yeah. You have to be passionate. You have to be motivated. But when you, when you are defeated, you don't leave the room. Yes, don't. Don't, please don't leave the room. They will take back everything that you've accomplished. You stick around and you wait to the next fight. That's right, because it will come. It will come. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm just so happy to be on this campus because just in the last two weeks of engaging with students, they want to get involved, they want to yeah. get active. They want to they wanna sit where Michael and I have, have been sitting for the last 20, 30 years, and guess what? We are so ready to seat get up. Seat is yours. <laughs> it is ready. I, I'm going to keep yours. it warm, and by the way, I'm going to start, I'm going to end with the table. We have some interesting things that we can put on the menu. Yeah. Your generation will have much more to serve up for the future, but you got to get to the table. Yeah. You got to understand that you have to serve. And I want to thank you in advance because I know you're ready to serve. 100%. All right. All right. Thank well, you. Well, let me, uh, you have a question? Last one. Last one. Okay. Final one for our great reception. This won't take too long. Um, I'm Angela Pacheyan, a PhD student in political science. Great. Hey. And um, thank you. Uh, I had two questions written here that I was ready to ask. And as I stood in line and listened to everyone and thought about everybody in the room and how everybody is passionate and, and, and are trying to find your passion, I completely changed my question. Oh, good. And my question is a question, uh, but kind of a statement and just looking for both of you guys' thoughts on um, the larger picture of how Trump said he was going to make America great again. Mm. And don't throw tomatoes at me, but I believe he is. So I believe that we have been complacent. We are America. We are the most powerful country on planet Earth. So we have gotten complacent. And in that complacency and in that comfort, I believe that in the larger picture that we needed something to shake us up and that the Great Recession in 2008, that was the beginning to try and make us a little uncomfortable, which it did quite well. But that wasn't enough. We didn't learn. We had to go deeper. And so if you pull back and, and look at the role the path of Donald Trump. Uh, not that I'm, you know, giving him pats on the back or anything like that, but I have to pull back and I have to analyze and I have to see what is he doing. And he's not only doing something for this country, but he's doing something for the world because the world watches us. The world takes from, from where we're coming from and they say, oh, this is what America does. Well, I guess we better try and do that. So. What I'm saying is that I believe Trump has to piss each and every one of us off in a personal way, like your playground. It has to be personal. People looking for your passion, it's coming. He's going to piss you off on something sooner or later. And it's going to be awfully personal where you go to Twitter or you buy those shoes 
or you get up and run for office or you go and get arrested, you know, in, in the, in the, on the Senate floor. So I'm saying stay lit, but know that there's a, a, a bigger purpose. We have a responsibility as the greatest country on the planet to, to lead. Um, and I don't know if I'm just crazy or if I'm just too philosophical, but those are thoughts that I had after wearing two weeks, after wearing black for two weeks when, when Hillary lost. But that's how I pulled out and, and I sort of made sense of it. And I'd like to know from professionals, am I crazy? <laughs> or, or am I on the right track at this opportunity for us to really make effective change, not only in the country, but around the whole world? I don't know if it's the Trump effect uh, that led 38,000 women to uh, decide that they wanted to run for public office. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the Trump effect that has gotten more young people engaged this political cycle than we've seen in decades. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the Trump effect that is getting people excited about voting this fall, but I do know that people are woke uh, and that they want to take more ownership of their future. And so whether we give credit to the president or just look at ourselves and decide that this was our moment, I do believe that there's a, we're, we're at a tipping point and people are beginning to become more engaged and that's good for our democracy. And thank you for your question. Michael, you want to close? No, I, I, I really do appreciate your question and I uh, identify with the, the, a lot of the sentiment uh, that goes with that, this idea that we've been pushed uh, to confront probably some truths that we've fallen asleep about or not really paid attention to. And I get that. Uh, I paid attention when um, Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus, my former uh, general counsel and then ch uh, chief of staff uh, to the president, sat on a stage and talked about uh, what the goals of the administration were, and that was to deconstruct the administrative state. And my takeaway from that was not about the buildings and the institutions, but it was more about the philosophies, the ideas, and the people. Uh, and that has been summarily happening. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know if, if it takes something or someone to shake you enough to realize where you are, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and to pay attention to that space, or if it's something you come into. But the question then becomes, what do you do while you're there? and you referenced the mm -hmm. marches and those who have begun to get in, in, involved civically. But having said all of that, and I do take to heart what you said about, about what the president has done directly or indirectly, there is an expectation that we have of the president, the most powerful person in the world, all right? There is an expectation um, of representation of us. Uh, I'm here to say that when he refers to the continent that my ancestors come, came from as a hole, that's not representative of me. Mm -hmm. That when he refers to my neighbor um, uh, who happens to be Mexican as a criminal, that's not representative of him or me. Uh, that when he brags on video about uh, how he likes to rub up and kiss women because they want that, that's not representative of my mother or my sister or my wife. Mm -hmm. So there is an expectation that I have. Uh, and part of what you said makes me think of some in my party who rest their laurels on the fact that we have Gorsuch and we're about to get Kavanaugh mm -hmm. and that we have tax cuts mm -hmm. and that we have changes in, in you know, this or that agency. But when we look in the mirror, it's like Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. We look like Dorian Gray by what we accept. If you're a member of the evangelical community, please don't talk to me again ever mm -hmm. in this life mm -hmm. about how I live my life, who I love, who I spend time with. You're right. You never had the right to judge me, but since you presumed it for the last 35 years, but because you now have a Supreme Court justice, mm -hmm that you're willing to acquiesce to all of this rife funk 
that emanates out of the White House, don't talk to me ever again <laughs> about how I live my life, how I love someone, who I love, how I serve my God. So there's a price to be paid for this feeling of MAGA. Mm. I'm not willing to pay that price. And I'm and not the question either. is, are you? I am right? not either, and I'm sure we are not. Thank, thank you. you. Well, on that note, can we thank Michael Still for coming to Howard University? It's great to be back. Right? Thank you all very much. And I also want to thank Colby and Gwen King once again for your leadership. Absolutely. And creating this endowed chair. And pro Provost, Ms. Walters, Mr. Hatley. I thought the Provost was a student when I got oh, here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, he dressed the gun. <laughs> I, I, uh, and I also want to thank the students in WHUT. WHUT. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.